thanks everybody for joining us on this fall day for our finale event. It's a beautiful fall day. It's kind of strange. Um, uh, I'm Barika Williams. I'm the executive director of the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development, or ANHD. Um, and we're excited to now be here with our seventh and final um, event for our 2023 Community Development Conference. Um, yeah, I know, right? Um, I also want to thank uh, Sayuri, who is in the room. Um, and if anybody needs Spanish translation, um, please make sure to reach out to somebody on the ANHD staff team, because we do have um, simultaneous translation for anybody who needs it. Um, so firstly, just where we are, I want us to all sort of pause for a moment. It's been a shocking, evolving, terrifying, overwhelming, complicated um, time with everything going on, geopolitics across the US and here in New York City. I, I'm not gonna try to put more words to it, but I think it's important to just note that we're all sort of stepping out of a lot happening to be here today. Um, and so I'm gonna borrow from other people's brilliance, which was public advocate Jamani Williams, and say, let's just all start with like a deep breath, right? All right, so that's a little better, maybe. Um, uh, so for those of you who are new to ANHD, our work is to build community power to win affordable housing, thriving and equitable neighborhoods for all New Yorkers. Um, we're a member-based um, organization of community groups across all of New York City. Um, and we combine research, advocacy, um, grassroots organizing, cap capacity building, data analysis to support our work and our members um, and all of the things that we're trying to do in local neighborhoods in New York City and citywide. Um, and a core way that we approach this work is really thinking that and rooting everything in an understanding that housing justice is racial justice, is economic justice, and how these things connect and that they're intertwined and that we are having separate conversations. Um, so we love our conference um, and our events to be about community building, about building connections, about building relationships. Um, so we're gonna start that off now from the beginning. Um, we like to set this tone. So turn to somebody near you and we're gonna say neighbor. I'm here to listen, learn, and connect. Right? We're gonna get started. Listen, this is what this is about. We're about having these conversations. Um, so to get a sense of who's in the room, um, we're gonna, do I, I can't, this is new for me. We're gonna put up Slido. Has everybody else used this? Okay, so hold up your phone, scan the QR code that's up there. It'll pop up with a little link. You can click on the link and it'll automatically take you to the right question. Um, and you should share a place here in New York City that you live in, work in, or hail from. Like where, where are you doing your stuff? I don't care whether it's a street, a borough, uh, what, what's, what's rep your place, right? City Island, Bed-Stuy just down the street, East Williamsburg, Bourne Hill, Financial District, Bushwick, oh, we've got an emoji, Astoria, Queens, right? Flatbush, Clinton Hill, Downtown Brooklyn, Battery Park City, Jamaica, Queens, I was like, where am I, I'm missing some. Manhattan, Elmhurst, South Bronx, um, Corona, oh, Boogie Down, you have to say that one, you can't skip that one, right? You've gotta say Boogie Down. Uh, my Bronx contingent is very strong. Um, uh, so right, this is like, this is all the places folks here are. You can keep adding to it, you can keep populating it, um, but I think it is important to always note that like, we are a community of people who both work in these places and oftentimes live and exist in these places, right? So this is like our duality of how we do this work and who we are, often many of us as New Yorkers, whether it was your permanent home or your new home, um, depending on, or your old home, any, depending on who you are. Um, so yeah, so we'll continue to, I'll, we'll leave this up for a while as people keep popping, populating it. Um, so for, or actually I'm not in charge of the tech, so I can't say that. There we go. Um, <laughs> so um, this is ANHD's 12th annual community development conference and following COVID, um, what we did was we took some time to reimagine what our conference looked like. Um, and so we changed from our one day traditional in Midtown hotel, 
you know, sit at a table conference and we took it to our members and our communities and our neighborhoods. Um, and so I'm gonna recap for folks what we've been doing over the past couple weeks in the month of October. So we started with an opening discussion on reflecting on what is New York City community development with some of our original and longstanding leaders. Um, what were those early LIHTC deals like and what was the point? What were folks organing, organizing around some 40 years ago? How has the professionalization of this work of the community development sector impacted and really potentially changed what the work looks like? So this was our first event. Next up, we were in the Lower East Side and heard um, from the FDIC on the upcoming sale of Signature Bank's, um, what formerly was Signature Bank's multifamily rent stabilization loans. Um, and then we heard directly from tenants and organizers who are in those buildings, who are, back one, um, who are in those buildings, who um, are live in them, who are fighting back on the conditions and what it looks like to live in an over leveraged building. So this one here, oh, this is banking. Okay, so next one. Um, following that, we were led by the team at Northwest Bronx Community and Clergy, um, and we hit the pavement and got to meet and hear and talk directly with small businesses around the Kingsbridge Armory. Um, uh, one of our speakers later will be able to could speak to this even better than I could, but we're now headed into our third ever armory redevelopment proposal. Um, uh, in the history of, I mean, I think I know people who have worked across all three of them, which feels crazy. Um, uh, and so we heard directly from businesses about what they need, what they're seeing, and the precarity of trying to run a business and the threat of displacement when they live every single day and operate their businesses every single day with no leases and facing rent hikes literally at any moment. Uh, then we went to up to Harlem and we heard some amazing and powerful stories from those who, ex who have experienced homelessness and incarceration. Um, we listened to all too often how these are policies that get separated into these like different buckets, right? Whether it's like the organization or whether it's the government agency or right, we tend to like put them in these separate spaces, um, but really heard directly from people about how the lived experience is really, it's a really combined and joint and interactive live ex lived experience. The one often leads to the other and one often follows the other, but who it is and how you experience it varies between different people's um, uh, journeys. Um, and we got, that also got paired with some beautiful um, art and creativity. Um, and so I'd encourage everybody, if you get a chance to head up to the Schomburg Center in Harlem, um, which has a beautiful exhibit on criminal justice, making time, uh, and will be there until December 5th. Uh, then we headed by, we got Grow House guided us through a deeply powerful walking um, tour through place and time, actually, um, through black, through, throughout the streets of Flatbush, Brooklyn. Um, ANHD and Urban Design Forum um, are proud uh, that the R Initiative Local Center is supporting Grow House's work on developing a community vision um, for this African burial ground that is in this community and in this neighborhood, um, and for them to really be thinking about creating a future vision and story and a way of reimagining both what is public space and who is telling and creating public spaces and the stories that we're telling with them. Um, lastly, we hopped on a bus. This was just earlier this week um, with Evergreen and Business Opportunity Center, Bach, um, and they took us through uh, a couple of different is industrial business zones um, where we got to meet with manufacturers and hear firsthand about the challenges and opportunities around protecting and preserving our manufacturing sector. Um, this is a big area of work that ANHD has worked on for a while, and the reason we think about it and approach it as tied to community development is because uh, manufacturing is one of the second highest job sectors in all of New York City, and often people didn't realize, um, and is also the highest paying sector for people of color um, without a college education. Um, so it's a huge part of our income earning stability base for our folks of color, especially those who don't necessarily have advanced degrees. Uh, so that's the six events that we've had to get up to here. And I wanna give everybody a little bit of a preview um, uh, of a new project that we've been working on with Design for Democracy and Partners and Partners uh, that currently we're calling the Community Development Archive. 
Uh, and this is just recognizing for everybody, this is ANHD's 40th, 49th year, and so next year we will celebrate our 50th anniversary. Uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of amazing to realize that seven organizations a while ago said, let's create this thing, and it's still around, and it's still humming, and also still really contributing and adding to this whole environment and ecosystem here in New York City. Um, but we realized, both as we are looking at our 50th, but also as we've gone through COVID and other things and realized we've, we've lost a lot of our knowledge and history and infrastructure. And so paired up with some awesome uh, partners uh, to really collect um, and start to curate an archive of what we've been doing and what all has transpired in the past 50 years. Um, so this includes, um, you can go to the next one, let me see. Um, this includes some of the photos and articles um, that chart through the past 50 years of community development. What are the main events? What are some of the main policies? Um, right now we're in the 1960s, right? Um, how are we thinking about urban renewal? How does this tie to the civil rights movement? And as a part of this, we've been interviewing um, a lot of our legacy and long-standing folks in community development to have them tell us what this was about, what this was like, like how did you come up with this first idea or you know where did Impact Brooklyn or Bed-Stuy Restoration or Riseboro or Ascendant come from? Um, because also as we start to go into a next generation of community development, it's so important and critical that we have these stories across bricks and mortar development, community organizing, and community design centers to understand what we're rooted in and where we're coming from. So I will say to everybody, stay tuned, and we will have something happening in December um, where we'll ask folks to join us and come uh, sort of interact with the preview of this um, uh, as we try to like capture and catalog a lot of this history for generations to come. Um, so now we're at the finale event. Um, uh, it's the, been a long journey. Um, I want to thank a lot of the various elected officials and government officials and agencies that have been, us, been with us throughout the events and are here today, including Public Advocate Jamani Williams, State Senator Khalil Anderson, State Senator J Zalmar Myri, Assembly Member Latrice Walker, Brooklyn BP Antonio Renoso, Council Member um, Jen Gutierrez, um, SBS Commissioner Kevin Kim, and the teams at EDC, SBS, DCP, the Mayor's Office for Equity, the Mayor's Office for Workforce Development, HPD, and HCR. Hopefully I didn't miss anybody in doing that. Um, uh, but it's been really great to have government partners be a part of these various different experiences with us and be able to really see what's happening on the ground um, with us as well. Um, so I'd like to thank our movement leader sponsor, City, who you'll hear from later, our community convener sponsor, New York Community Bank, um, uh, our neighborhood defenders sponsors, Goldman Sachs and Wells Fargo, um, our lead law sponsor, Goldstein Hall, um, who has been one of our key partners in actually um, uh, providing the trainings like the Affordable Housing Institute, um, so where we're really teaching folks the skills, the concrete um, tasks, the new laws, what's the new update um, that we need to be able to stay um, current in a very constantly changing and, and new uh, pieces coming up, um, community development movement and, and environment. Um, but last and last but not least, the ANHD Board of Directors um, who are sponsoring this series as a group. Um, and I cannot say enough in terms of thanks to them uh, for both all of their support since I've come on as ED, um, uh, but also for us as a team sort of really pushing the envelope on this conference series and a whole variety of other things. Um, and so I wanna bring out two of ANHD's amazing board members, uh, Bernal Greer and Scott Short, and they're gonna give you some brief remarks. So thank you, Barika, and um, isn't she amazing? Just thinking about, you know, these, to have six forums over this period of time and being able to engage community, it's a lot of work. So I have to commend Barika, the staff, the events planners, the supporters for all being here and, and really making this all come true. 
So my name is Vernell Greer. I'm the executive director of Impact Brooklyn. I also happen to be the board chair for the for ANHD. And just a little bit about Impact Brooklyn. We are officially known as Pratt Area Community Council, and we will be celebrating 60 years of being engaged in community. We are like so many of the members of ANHD affordable housing, or what I like to call income targeted housing developers. We are owners of property. We have several different programs, whether it's home ownership, whether it's community organizing, helping people that are facing eviction to be able to stay in their homes and being able to work through, plus working on economic development with small businesses. So we all share very much in the same mission and i um, just happy to be here today, and I'd like to introduce Scott. Thanks for now. Uh, my name is Scott Short. I am the CEO of Riseboro Community Partnership, a nonprofit community development organization based in Bushwick. And I'm also the board treasurer of this wonderful organization, ANHD, uh, that did so much great work bringing us all together today and over the past couple weeks. A uh, little, little more about Riseboro, we are a 50-year-old uh, community development organization and we do affordable housing and community-based services that are focused in homelessness prevention, uh, economic empowerment, health equity, senior services, um, youth services, and uh, we really try to provide a holistic set of services to uh, get marginalized communities on the path to economic and social mobility. So I'm so happy to be here with you all today, to be here with ANHD and all of the great groups in the community development ecosystem. Thank you, Scott. Scott and I are also partnering, Riceboro and Impact, along with another company, Urbane, are partnering on a development of housing in on the border of bed and Ocean Hill, I guess mm -hmm. you would call it. Um, and developing over 250 units of senior and, again, income-targeted housing in the community. So more to come on that as members also of ANHD. Um, community development organizations are really meeting the moment, serving our communities and channeling the right resources in the right directions. We have and continue to serve the community caretakers providing everything from affordable housing, developing development to door-to-door -door eviction protection, from small businesses supports to home ownership counseling, and we are activating public space in our neighborhoods while growing just growing jobs in our manufacturing sector. ANHD is who brings and supports these community development corp organizations. Whether you've been an ANHD member for 49 years or for one year, we understand the unique value ANHD provides to its membership organizations, our staff, and our city. Scott? Yeah. That's right, Brunel. ANHD is a uh, commitment to community development organizations is really beat really built into its DNA. Um, all of the board of directors of ANHD, including myself and Burnell, are executives from membership organizations. So we all have uh, full-time jobs running our, our organizations, and yet we dedicate our time to ANHD because we recognize the importance of the organization and the value that it brings to the sector. Um, and we're, we are all uh, very committed to this community development movement. Um, and it is truly a movement. It's come a long way in the last 49 years, um, and we continue to build momentum because we believe that nonprofit community development organizations are the best stewards of public funds when it comes to affordable housing development, and we are the closest to the communities that um, need, need the services that we provide and have the most democratic service model in terms of determining how those public resources are spent. So that's, that's why we are so committed to ANHD and the movement that we have built over the decades. So it's who ANHD is, because that's who we are as neighborhood-based organizations. Barika and the team have really stepped up and redoubled their commitment and focus 
on this. That's why we as a board supported and sponsored this shifting, this conference into our neighborhoods. And it is what brings us to the conversation we are going to have today, racial equity in community development. It's not enough to say we, well, we work in communities of color or immigrant communities. So that counts. We want to challenge ourselves with all you to, with all of you, to really integrate how we, a &HD, and New York City community development could be better advancing justice and equity. So now, Emily Goldstein, a &HD's Director of Organizing and Advocacy, is going to come out and get us ready to think about this conversation. So Emily. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. OK. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Emily. Uh, as Brunel mentioned, I'm the Director of Organizing and Advocacy at ANHD. Um, I'm just here to sort of get us all really thinking about how the themes and topics we're about to hear from our keynote and in our moderated discussion connect to our everyday work and everyday lives. Uh, so just sort of like getting our brains percolating a little. Uh, so we're going to go back to the Slido. Uh, everybody get out your phones. Um, and we've got a first question up. Go ahead and use your phone to scan the QR code if you can. If you can't, you can just like go ahead and think about it to yourself. Um, so which of these, you know, how do you, ooh, that moved. <laughs> uh, how do you see racial inequity show up in your community? And you can check any and all of these, because we know that like in a lot of cases, these things show up in more than one way. We also know that a lot of times in our day-to-day -day work, we are working on issues that really um, have everything to do with racial equity, with uh, discrimination, with disparities between you know, different racial and, econo and socioeconomic groups, but it doesn't necessarily always get framed that way or show up that way. Um, this is also a great opportunity for our keynote speaker to like get a little bit more sense of who's in the room, what does everybody work on. So a lot of people saying real estate speculation, closely followed by housing development patterns, displacement of local small businesses, evictions and housing insecurity, infrastructure investment by government, fewer folks who work on discrimination um, against prospective tenants and home buyers or access to banking. So a lot of folks who are working around housing development, uh, eviction and housing insecurity issues, as well as small business displacement. Seems to be who we have in the room. And these are all issues that we know show up in different ways in all of the different communities and neighborhoods that everybody put up on that previous slide when Brick was up here. Um, so we're going to do one more of these. Uh, we know that all of these are issues that we see in our communities. So what are we all already doing? And again, maybe it doesn't always get framed that way. But what are we all already doing to actually advocate and organize and engage in campaigns that help to advance racial equity in community development? Um, so I want to know what folks who are in the room have worked on. Uh, it can be something you're currently working on. It can be something you've dealt with in the past. This can be as a paid job. This can be as a volunteer. Um, so far, I've seen a lot of folks who have worked on local or citywide land use fights, which is near and dear to my personal little heart. Um, organizing merchants and small businesses, several folks in the room. Uh, source of income discrimination, right to counsel. Oh, lots of things moving around. We've got right to counsel and eviction defense, which I know Brunel was talking about earlier. Um, racial impact study legislation was an exciting win several years ago. Uh, and fewer folks who worked on commercial tenant harassment law, but that's okay. If you want to know more about that, Belanda from ANHD is here, and she coordinates our United for Small Business NYC coalition. You can find her after the program and ask her about it. Cool. Okay, so a lot going on in our communities and a lot that everybody is already engaging in day to day, um, particularly a lot of folks here working on land use issues and small business issues, which is really exciting. 
Um, and so I want everybody to sort of like keep in mind what you are engaging with and what you are seeing day to day in your own work in your own communities and sort of like how this plays out in concrete ways on the ground as we now start to shift into um, introducing our keynote speaker. So I'm going to bring Barika back for that portion um, and then we'll move forward. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Emily. Um, uh, and there's one set of folks that I did not get a chance to thank yet, so I want to make sure I add them in, um, which is a very specific and very special thank you to the ANHD staff and team. Um, so we do most of these events ourselves um, with the assistance of amazing Loose Productions, um, Lucy Lydon and her team, uh, which we could not do these without. Um, but we kind of curate and set all of these events on our own with our partners and our other member organizations. Uh, and so really want to recognize all of the staff team um, who puts on each one of these individual events, um, and especially Lucy, Lauren, Anais, and Chris L, um, who have to do this across all of these events um, as a core set of teams. So I just want to say thank you to them. Uh, all right, so now we're going to get to the main show, which I am incredibly excited and a little geeked out about. Um, so we are, you know, well, we're going to do this as like more of a, a, a just like, well, we're going to try to curate some conversation. As a group, this is kind of a great opportunity. Most of the time, you wouldn't get to hear Andre Perry in a group like this. So it means that folks will be able to like ask some questions and we'll be able to get to them from the stage. Um, so I will, um, we're going to, the Slido thing, right? How do we do that? So if you go to the Slido QR code that you just had, if it's still open, at the top on the left, there is a QA function. Um, and so if you just click over to the QA, while we're up here, go ahead and send questions. And as other people are li sending questions that you see, you can also hit the thumbs up to say, like, I like that question. Um, which is a maybe a high tech way of you know waving your card from the audience. Um, so we're we're shifting over to higher tech. So we'll be able to uh, sort of talk about that from the stage. Um, uh, so we are honored to welcome Dr. Andre Perry, um, a prominent leader and thinker um, and author, um, to our keynote this final um, and finale event. Um, Dr. Perry is the David M. Rubenstein Fellow at the Metropolitan Policy Program. Um, of the Brookings Institution. He's also a scholar in re residence at American University and a professor of practice at, of economics um, at Washington University, which I did not know. Um, he's nationally known and respected commentator on race, structural inequality, and education. Um, uh, he, of particular note, uh, uh, under his recent scholarship at Brookings has analyzed majority black places and institutions in America focusing on highlighting valuable assets worthy of increased investment. Um, he's an author of an amazing book, Know Your Price, Valuing Black Lives and Property in America's Black Cities. If you, don't, if you haven't ever read it, I would strongly suggest looking it up and getting it. Um, I actually had somebody when they saw who was speaking, they were like, oh my god, we just circulated this book to our whole office. Um, so I was like, yes. Um, uh, in addition, uh, uh, he has co-authored a groundbreaking 2018 Brookings Institution report called The Devaluation of Ac Assets in Black Neighborhoods um, and has presented its findings on the price of homes in black neighborhoods across the country, including to the H U.S. House Financial Services Committee. Um, we're going to, so I said, as I said, we're going to be asking some questions at the end, so please submit your audience Q&A. Um, uh, it's a great opportunity. I'm incredibly excited to have him with us um, and to get to hear uh, his, his brilliant thoughts and remarks and just thinking about, like, this is somebody that sometimes I see on MSNBC on my TV. To have him here in the audience with us is pretty cool. Um, so we will bring him out now, um, Dr. Andre Perry. Isn't Barika the best? Give it up to the, the ANHD and the entire board and staff. Give it up for them as well. I'm Andre Perry. 
I'm going to get right into it. I am a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, and I study black majority cities and neighborhoods, um, places where the share of the black population is 50% or higher. Um, obviously, there are too many uh, neighborhoods to put on a map, but here are the black majority cities, small and large. There are more than 1,200 um, black majority municipalities all over the country. Most are in the south, um, many creeping up the eastern seaboard, some in the Midwest, a few on the west coast. Now, I study um, the assets, and in, in, in particular, I measure the assets in each and every one of those dots. Um, and what I mean by that, I, I measure the value of homes, businesses, infrastructure, schools, um, all the, the things that if you invested in, in them, you would see economic and social mobility, um, presumably. presumably. Um, it, ultimately, I want to see the impact of structural racism on those assets, figuring out ways to restore the value that's been extracted by racism. Now, I'm going to start by, start by examining one particular asset that's important. It's a home. Now, this is my home. This is where I grew up. This is 1320 Hill Avenue, Wilkinsburg, Pennsylvania. If you don't know Wilkinsburg, I didn't hear anybody go, all right. <laughs> Now, if I said Brooklyn, stand up, y'all be like, no. <laughs> well, Wilkinsburg, I'll represent myself, um, is a small black majority municipality surrounded by Pittsburgh on three sides. Um, as you can see here, the, the home is, is, is pretty damaged. When I took this picture, it was, um, the house was, the roof was bowed. Uh, the um, windows and, and doors boarded up. It was valued somewhere in the neighborhood of $13,000. Now, um, that struck me as a very low number, but the home is worth so much more to me. You see that woman in the upper right-hand corner? Um, her name is Elsie Boyd. I call her mom. See, mom, um, how I came to know mom, mom made a deal with my maternal grandmother before I was born. She made a deal that she would take me into 1320 Hill Avenue, um, largely because my mother at the time was very poor. Um, she already had a child at 15. She had me when she was 17. She was probably abused. And mom did what a lot of black matriarchs did at the time. She took in kids with struggling parents. And she took in a lot of kids. Um, um, some uh, stayed a few weeks, some stayed a few months, many stayed uh, for years. I would stay from birth to till when I graduated from high school. And you can see she took in black kids, white kids, biracial children, anyone who had a story similar to mine or, or different, um, some, sometimes different. One of the reasons why she had to take me in, this is my father, um, pictured here. He was a heroin addict. He was in and out of prison for um, crimes, for everything from um, theft to um, beating up people. Um, he eventually um, was murdered inside a Jackson State Penitentiary a day before his 27th birthday. Um, and growing up, um, and um, he, I was told a lot of stories about making choices, not to make choices that my father made. So in, in researching for my book, Know Your Price, Valuing Black Lives and Property in American Black Cities, available wherever fine books are sold. Um, in researching for my book, um, I tried to examine the, the built environment around uh, in which where he lived and where mom lived. I'm going to save you a big history lesson. I'm just going to go through them briefly. But they both lived in areas that were redlined, that where the federally backed homeowners loan corporation drew red lines around uh, predominantly black neighborhoods, deeming them unworthy of various federal invest investments. Uh, they both were displaced by highway construction. Um, how I how my family ended up in Pittsburgh is that, that my father's family uh, had to move because of three the con uh, construction of 375. Uh, how my, my mom ended up in Wilkinsburg 
Uh, she was displaced by the building of the Civic Arena and the highways around that, that facility. They were both subjected to the unfulfilled promises of urban renewal. You know something about urban renewal in New York City. Entire neighborhoods were bulldozed with nothing that came about uh, from that. Uh, predatory lending was all around them, contract leasing all around them. Um, and finally, they were surrounded by racial housing covenants. And so they couldn't necessarily leave easily the neighborhoods they were in. Now, all of those, those policies certainly had an impact uh, when they were erected, but they certainly have an impact on today's housing market. I wanted to look in particular how those collective policies could have impacted home values in various neighborhoods. And here is a chart, if you look on that x-axis, that's the share of the black population in a zip code. And on the y-axis is indicated by the prices on top of the bars, and we have uh, a median price of Redfin and median value of in, in the census, using census data. Um, that's the average list price of those homes in those neighborhoods. So on the far left, um, and, and you look in that, in that bottom row, that's the sh uh, in neighborhoods where the share of the black population is less than a percent on average, across the country, those homes are priced around $422,000. And in neighborhoods where the share of the black population is 50% or higher, on average homes across the country are about $187,000. Now, a lot of people will say that's because of education, that's because of crime, but those are things you can control for in a study, and that's what we did. We looked at that, we took that list price, and then we controlled for structural characteristics. So square footage, the, the number of rooms. Um, and then we controlled for neighborhood amenities. So education, crime, walkability, all those fancy Zillow metrics to get an apples to apples comparison between homes in black neighborhoods and homes in white neighborhoods. And what we found pretty much astounds is homes still in, in black neighborhoods still are underpriced. So it was about 50% before, more or less. Um, they're still underpriced by about 23%, about 48,000 per, uh, 45,000 per, per home. Cumulatively, there's about $162 billion in lost equity in black neighborhoods. $162 billion. And this is happening all over the country. Wherever you see a magenta circle, that's where homes in black neighborhoods are priced lower than their white counterparts. Wherever you see a green circle, that's where homes in black neighborhoods are priced higher than there are a few. In the New York City metro area, homes in black neighborhoods are underpriced by 21%, about 89000 per home. Now, this there ranges, as I stated, all over the country. In Panama City of Florida, if you helicoptered a home in a black neighborhood and placed it in a similarly situated uh, a, a neighborhood in a white community, it would increase in value by 132%. Princeton, 81% difference. Gainesville, Florida, 80% uh, difference. Greenville, North Carolina, 73, about 74 percent. Now, again, there are places um, in which homes in black neighborhoods are priced higher. Um, Athens, Clark County, um, Ur Urbana, Illinois, and Michigan City um, all have positive home values in black neighborhoods. Now, there are a, a few cities where I can uh, say with certainty that um, the, the, the price difference is uh, in black neighborhoods a result of assets is doing better, performing better in those neighborhoods. Now, there are a lot of uh, majority black places where you're starting to see white people move in. And just as that chart showed, if you le read left or right, that is uh, neighborhoods get blacker, uh, the values go down. The opposite is true, that as people move into black neighborhoods, 
automatically the values go up. Now, 162 billion, we th particularly in New York and other places, we throw around billions like it's, you know, nothing, right? But I just want to, just, to make this point, 162 billion, what does that number mean? What is 162 billion? Well, 162 billion would have financed more than 4.6 million black-owned businesses across the country based upon the average amount black people use to start their firm. It would have paid for more than 11 million four-year degrees based upon the average amount of a four-year public education. It would have replaced the pipes in Flint, Michigan 3,000 times over. It would have covered nearly all of Hurricane Katrina damage, and it's doubled the annual economic burden of the opioid crisis. It's a big number. So um, when I, I wanted to bring that point, that last bullet home, um, so to speak, um, because my father lived in a neighborhood where the home values were at the market rate or the white rate, he would have greater opportunity to start a business, go to college, his schools would have been better financed, the city coffers would have been more resourced, he would have had better services all around. His life and my life would have been fundamentally different. This is why I say all the time, like it keeps my teeth white, there's nothing wrong with black people that ending racism can't solve. When things go wrong in black neighborhoods, what do we do? We blame black people. Now, my, one of my favorite quotes um, or sayings comes from a philosopher, Tic Tac Nan, Vietnamese philosopher who recently passed maybe um, two years ago. But one of my favorite sayings is that if you're growing a head of lettuce and it's not growing, you don't blame the lettuce. You look to see if the soil's enriched. You look to see if there's sunlight. You look to see if it's getting proper rainwater. You never blame the lettuce. What we do need to understand in community development is that we cannot blame the lettuce, that we have got to believe in this idea that nothing grows without proper investment. Nothing. I don't care if you're talking about um, um, uh, housing, education, uh, people. Nothing grows without investment. So I want us to really let that seep in before I move forward of doing this work or uh, uh, presenting this, uh, the rest of the research that, that this is about examining the structural factors that impact growth in our community. Now, I'm going to set this up. Um, this is when I released that report in, in 2018 with my colleague Jonathan Rothwell, uh, it made a big, big splash. Um, we made our way to Capitol Hill. We had to testify um, uh, around this issue, and I got to present my data alongside uh, the uh, leaders of the appraisal industry because um, naturally a lot of people point to appraisers largely because they are explicitly charged with pricing on these matters. Now, um, this is Representative Al Green in front of you uh, on the screen, and he asked us a very simple question. Do we believe that there's discrimination in the appraising of black homes or homes in black neighborhoods. Now, I'm gonna let the, the, the clip go, but I, I just want you to, to listen and, and let this seep in. So, roll the, roll the tape. If you think black people are being discriminated when their property is being appraised, would you kindly raise your hand? One person on the panel. If you think that, for fear that I'm not communicating well, if you think that black people are not being discriminated against when their property is being appraised, if you think they're not being discriminated against, kindly raise your hand. Okay, hands now, we're getting some consternation, I see. Now, I don't show that video to shame people. Well, maybe just a little, <laughs> just a little, because many of the people at the that table are no longer there in those leadership positions. But um, there is this undeniable belief that, that, or this belief, unrelenting relief, belief, that racism doesn't exist. 
right? That, in fact, after this hearing, the appraisers surrounded me to say, we're not doing anything illegal. We're not doing anything wrong. And I said, yes, you're not doing anything illegal. And you're still having these impacts. For most of American, America's history, it was legal to segregate. It was legal to discriminate um, against black people and others. And so for me, I just, I, I just want us to understand that many of the practices that were in place during segregation are still with us today. So I'm going to move on quickly. Whoop. Here we go. There we go. Now, since then, since uh, we uh, released that report, we uh, we started to get the appraisal data, the the federally federal housing. Finance Administration released appraisal data, because I used Redfin data, we used census data, we used other proxies um, to get this, and they finally released appraisal data. And, and what we found from that data that um, black majority neighborhoods are twice as likely to be appraised under the contract um, price than homes in majority white neighborhoods. And, but, and the median appraisal is 15% lower in black majority neighborhoods than in white majority places, where it's 15% and 1% when it's under the contract price, which accounts for about, so the bad appraisals in black neighborhoods account for 20% of that $162 billion. So there are other factors at play, and I've always said that we can't just look at appraisers. While, while there are certainly some bad appraisers out there, by far most uh, appraisers come in above the contract price, but there's other factors. There's underwriting, there's real estate agent behavior, there's other things that we have to be committed to exploring. Now, I'm going to quickly pivot to business um, because um, people don't really grasp it, but most businesses are started with what? The, using the equity in people's homes. So if you don't have equity in a home and if you have lower home ownership, it's less likely you're going to have businesses. So I'm going to just talk a lot about businesses here. Now, black people are about 14% of the population, but only 2% of employer firms. That's firms with more than one employee. And um, only 1% of black business owners were able to obtain a loan in their founding year compared to 7% of white entrepreneurs. You, both numbers are relatively low because, again, most people start their businesses using um, their equity in their, in their home. Now, black entrepreneurs are denied bank loans twice as often, and when we do get bank loans, um, they're at a much higher interest rate. Now, um, a lot of people will say that's because of the quality of the businesses. So just like in housing, I wanted to explore that issue. You'll, you hear it all the time. All oh, the quality, the service is bad. So I wanted to explore that. So... We got the business revenue and, and race of business owners all across the country. And then we scraped all the Yelp businesses, uh, Yelp ratings from businesses all across the country to get a sense of quality. And again, we control for neighborhood conditions, um, spending power, education, all those things um, that would allow us to get an apples to apples comparison between businesses in black neighborhoods and businesses in white neighborhoods. And what we found, again, pretty much astounds that black, brown, and Asian-owned firms actually score higher on Yelp than our white counterparts. However, they get fewer stars when those businesses are located in black neighborhoods. So I'm going to explain. So see that magenta line? That's black, brown, and Asian-owned firms. That gray line is white firms and people who did not um, indicate race. Now, in every kind of neighborhood, black, brown, and Asian-owned firms actually score higher on Yelp. 
But as the neighborhood gets blacker, the scores go down, showing that the perception of the neighborhood is impacting the perception of the business. Now, you don't have to be an economist or, an, or have an MBA to understand that's wacky, um, largely because you want quality businesses to, be, to have quality in any kind of community. And, and, and you essentially create a situation where you force high quality businesses to then compete with low quality businesses. You don't want that. Now, this is costing highly rated businesses approximately $4 billion in revenues a year because obviously you get um, less stars, you're getting less revenue as a result. We estimate that you're getting you know, upwards of $4 billion in lost revenue. Now, um, but what the data um, showed, because I, by the way, I was scared to death to release this report, largely because um, one could read it and say, well, why should I operate a business in a black neighborhood, right? There was that real risk. But I rather run the risk of, 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 of instilling that fear than to miss the point of this whole exercise and that is to um, recite and to um, validate empirically what the black elders used to say all the time, and that is our ice is just as cold. Our ice is just as cold. That, that the businesses we, and, and, and property and other assets, in, in many cases, are just as good. It's only our perception that is getting in the way of investment. And we need to remove those perceptions. Now, um, you know, no one will ever confuse me with a conservative, um, but I will say this all the time, that in many ways, if we just allowed black and brown people and Asian folk to get the wealth that they deserve, we would not need all of these federal programs in times of crisis, right? Now, I just wanted this, this to do with this a, a, a small thought experiment. There, in the metro area, there are more than 14,000 black-owned employer firms. There are much, many more just businesses overall, but um, 14,000 employer firms in the New York City metro area accounted for 3% of employer businesses. If black businesses accounted for n about 20%, 19% of employer firms equivalent to the black population in the metro area, there will be 100, 000, or 101,000 more businesses across the metro area, 100,000 more businesses. And if the number of black businesses match the population size and employees per firm match the average business, it would create more than um, about 1,900 jobs across the metro area. A, a phenomenal trillions added to economy if we just got equity in this regard. Now I'm going to lump into, or leap into uh, commercial property um, to close us out here. Why commercial property? Um, well, I'll explain in a second, but um, it's much easier to maintain businesses if you own the property um, they operate in, right? It's pretty common sense, but I, this is always an amazing stat to me. 1% of households, 1% of households owns 81% of commercial property. The top 1% owns 81% of commercial property. Compare that to non-primary residential property, so rental properties, 50%, and owner-occupied, so people living in a home, about 16%. So the, the rental property and the the non-residential uh, commercial real estate, is, th those are amazing numbers, right? Now, why is that important? I'll just uh, go to, I don't want to take too much more time, but that middle column shows the overall wealth created from both commercial and residential property. Um, um, so the estimated loss in commercial real estate uh, overall is amazing about most, um, uh, about half of all wealth created from property comes from commercial real estate. And so billions are lost 
from people not being able to own commercial real estate. I will just, and the commercial real estate in black majority neighborhoods are underpriced by about 7%. So municipalities, again, neighborhoods are losing revenue simply because these properties are devalued in black neighborhoods or simply in black majority neighborhoods. Now, how do you combat this issue? Now, I'm, I'm, I, I, there's a lot of numbers behind this, but I'm just going to boil it down to three essential things. You have to invest in people. People, people, people. Now, I'll quickly go to the second column. column. If you invest simply in place, in brick and mortar, in infrastructure, and not people, you'll raise property values. People can't get, keep pace. They're, they're pushed out basic gentrification dynamics, right? So you got to invest in people. Cut the check. Cut the check. Cut the check to developers, cut the check to, to black brown developers, to entrepreneurs, to homeowners, to potential homeowners. Um, you got to figure out ways to give them capital. This is the way you restore the value that's been extracted by racism. We can't, we should not wave a magic wand to say automatically raise property values because what will happen? People won't be able to purchase, taxes will go up, it would be a disaster. So you got to figure out ways to restore value iteratively and you do that by cutting the check to people. And again, um, again, I'm not a conservative, even though I work at Brookings and people think I am, right? Uh, but I, I, I say this, we've got to remove the unnecessary bureaucratic barriers to getting equity. I go to too many programs and initiatives where we're, we're trying to get a grant or a loan to people of color, and they make them jump through all kind of hoops just to get that loan to prove that they're worthy. And let me, what I learned from the business, uh, the business uh, research is that Black and brown Asian-owned firm, they know how to operate businesses just like everyone else. They don't need any more education that you would give anyone else. And so we got to really um, uh, understand that growth is about equity and investment. If, they get, if people get that, you'll see that these underappreciated assets will grow. But you do need to invest in place because of devaluation. You see wanting infrastructure. You see social problems. You see a lot of different things. So you do need to invest in, in places. And I do believe you need to create incentives for people to operate businesses and to own commercial property in black neighborhoods, black and brown neighborhoods. We need to provide those carrots. Um, it, it can be tax credits. It can be um, some type of um, grants, programs, but we got to figure out ways to incentivize people to operate businesses and, and own property in black majority neighborhoods. Finally, we got to divest from racism. Now, I, I, I'm going to um, bring up the uh, appraisal issue to illustrate what I mean. That uh, um, we appraise property largely by using the price comparison model where we compare one home to another in a neighborhood to get an average price. Why that is fraught is that if you compare um, uh, one home to another in a neighborhood that's been discriminated against, you effectively just recycle the discrimination over and over again. Those neighborhoods never get out of it. Um, my only critique of the, uh, the HUD's efforts to diversify appraisers, which are 90% white, 75% male, um, it, 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 it is a problem. Um, it's a workforce issue. Um, but even if you diversify appraisers, if they're doing the same practices, you're going to get the same result. And so for me, we need to divest from that system. Um, but, but what I've learned in New Orleans when, when, during the take them down movements where uh, we, we were uh, removing Confederate monuments, we quickly learned you got to replace them with something. Um, so it's not about just removing 
racist pra uh, policies. You got to re replace them, install different things. I believe that we should have equity scoring systems in place, trying to ensure that the, the just distribution of resources before a policy is implemented. And I also believe that there are policies that encourage inclusion and in diversity. Now, in closing, I just want to, before we get to this fire side, I just want to say why I named my book Know Your Price, Valuing Black Lives and Property in America's Black City, available wherever fine books are sold. Um, it comes out of my favorite play in the whole wide world, Two Trains Running, um, by August Wilson. If you don't know August Wilson, you don't know Two Trains Running, catch a play, um, certainly here in New York City. But in that play, the main character's name is Memphis. Uh, Memphis has a restaurant, and, but it's about to be seized by the city of Pittsburgh by eminent domain. Um, the city of Pittsburgh offers M Memphis $15,000, to which um, Memphis says, I'm not selling my property for $15,000. I got my price. I know my price. I'm paraphrasing. But it's a refrain throughout the performance. I got my price. I know my price. There's another character, Hambone, um, who makes a deal with a proprietor who says, hey, I'll, I'll paint your fence if you, if you give me a hand. Hambone paints the fence, but the proprietor, the store owner, never gives him a ham. And throughout the play, he says, give me my ham, give me my ham, give me my ham. Now, we don't know if Hambone had mental illness before um, he made this deal, but he, he eventually goes mad and dies demanding his ham. Now, I hate telling that part because people are like, damn, that's pretty sad. Um, but there's actually a happy ending to um, the play Memphis, if you want to consider it happy ended, M Memphis gets $35,000 for his property, um, and we assume he's getting the market rate or the white rate. Now, the moral of the story is, the, the ostensible one, is that you got to know you have worth. Um, when, you have, when you know you have worth, you're willing to fight for it. And what I try to do with my research is give people the price to stand on. But the other part of the story, and, and this is why I think ANHD brought you here and why the members are so important, is because we can't do this work alone. Barika cannot be out here in these streets alone, right? That, that in order to... Um, accomplish these goals, there needs to be a collective um, effort or people will go crazy. You know, we lose too many people on these struggles. And I'm talking about all of these um, racial struggles. And, and certainly people are throwing out in, in today's context um, the terms colonialism, apartheid, white supremacy, almost interchangeable. But in order to accomplish the, the, um, the, the downstream impacts or to change the downstream impacts of these systems, you've got to work collaboratively, co um, collectively, across racial lines, across transnational lines. There's no way to do that. Um, because if you do not, the consequences are severe. So... I'm, I'm, I'm charging that with you. Work together. If you don't know somebody here, meet them. Say hello. I want to work with you. Get their name. Get their organization. Work with Barika to, to, um, to organize. But um, I'm glad I could present to you today, and I'm looking forward to this fireside chat. Thank you very much. I think it's on. Oh, there, mic check. See, he's the expert at this. Mic check. It's on. Um, so can we give uh, Andre Perry another round of applause? 
I know our little contingent over there was like, what? What's that number? What was that? Okay, so we're going to get into the conversation, and I want to introduce to everybody who's going to guide us through this conversation um, the amazing Kelly Terry, um, uh, who is um, currently now um, at the North Star Fund, previously at Cerdna Foundation, and a part of the ANHD community and movement, born and raised in the Bronx, uh, first career and then later in the career, tied to the Point CDC and just a part of the ANHD Bronx community development movement building family. So thank you, Kelly. Thank y'all. What an honor to be here with y'all tonight. Um, and I have to say that Boogie Down Bronx, that was me, <laughs> of course. All right, so we have a lot of um, really good juicy questions to get into. So let's just jump right into something that's very important. We have rapid fire questions to begin with. Things that would, you know, keep us up at night. So let's start with a few. Tea or coffee? Uh, coffee, for sure. Tea, all the way. Wow, already we're starting with controversy. I like this. This is gonna be good. Okay, ice cream or cake? Cake, 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 cake. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Barika. I'm ice cream. Wow. What about ice cream cake? See, can we fourth box this? I don't know. Um, pizza or pasta? Oh, pizza. Ooh. The crowd. I like y'all. I have opinions, and you're vocal That's a about tough it. One. That's this is a I'm tough like, one. do I never? It's, this is what we we end up in these weird conversations as a staff team. Do I never get the other one? Like ever? Okay, now you're making this complicated. You okay. need to choose. Right. You need to make I'll say a choice. Pizza. I'll say pizza. I'll say okay. pizza. Okay. And then there is also pasta pizza, y'all. Like, oh, come up to that's, Dino's. That sounds like a lot. Is like, that let's, big. why can't we do this? All right. Um, pets or plants? Man, let me tell you, one of the worst decisions I've made is to get this dog for my son. <laughs> plants. What? <laughs> okay, first of all, this dog has a name. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's uh, Rufus. 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 Why are you talking about Rufus? Why are you doing Rufus like I this? I know. Uh, plants. Like okay, I said. plants. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Brika. I, I am also plants because uh, one of the few black-owned hardware stores in New York City was near me in COVID, and so I decided I was going to try to keep them in business, which meant I spent an insane amount of money on plants. Yes, I like this. Investing in black-owned businesses. And I take it you value pets because you said the pet has a name well i mean i have kids do not quote me on this but <laughs> i kind of akin pet parents with parents okay. <laughs> so yes and you know i love my plants too so um music or podcasts mm. wow um i mean i love uh what uh the the talib uh, most deaf Dave Chappelle podcast where you get all both. Um, so I'm okay. going to go. I, I like when there's both um, because little, and I, little, I lived in New Orleans. I lived in New Orleans for 14 years, and music is such an um, it's 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 high culture. Yeah. And, and so um, I think in many instances, reading and music go hand in hand. I love that. What about you, Barika? I'm definitely music. I uh, right. grew up in a house where music and jazz were like the the soundtrack behind everything, gospel on Sunday. So I feel like my whole life has, I, I can hear a song and be like, I may not know the author, I may not know, but it, it can reference an exact place, an exact moment, a conversation. A, it'll take me back, so. I love it, the soundtrack of our lives. All right, now we're going to get down to um, some physical activities. Um, are we hiking or are we swimming? Oh, hiking for sure. Okay. Typically swimming, it, you know, if I'm, if I'm at a, a beach or a hot location, you know, maybe. But that's few and far between. I can um, hike all the time. Love it. This is hiking season, though. It is hiking season. I'm probably swimming. I'm not sure that I'm actually swimming, but I'm in the water. Does that make sense? 
Like I'm at the beach yeah, I'm in not the making water. This easy for me. I'm, you make my, it like, work up here. My efficiency of how okay. far I'm going when I'm swimming is a little questionable okay. sometimes, but I'm swimming. Okay, so we have a lot of conditions yeah. up here. See, hanging out with these community development folks and these planners with all these conditions. <laughs> okay, all right. So, um, and last but not least, what are three items that are must-haves in your kitchen? Oh man, must have? I gotta go with um, olive oil, because I use it for everything, um, pretty much. Second thought, yeah. Um, and, you know, this sounds crazy. I got an air fryer recently. <laughs> Holy heck! I do, that, I'm like an air. Is it life changing or oh, what? It's life changing. Absolutely yes. life changing. Just like when I got my first food processor, I was like, I am never shredding another piece of cheese by <laughs> hand ever again. So yeah, I'll go with those three. Okay, I, I'm I'm with you on the air fryer. I, I feel like, I think people hyped it up for a while and I was like, whatever, and then I ended yeah. up, the first time I was like, wait, what? This is, yeah, so air fryer. Um, you can do pancakes in an air fryer just recently, saw somewhere online, wow. so I'm gonna try that out, who knew? I have not tried that, okay. Um, wow. I'm uh, uh, Old Bay, okay. uh, which is telling where I'm actually okay. from, so there's always Old Bay seasoning. I want some fried fish later, yes. let's go. Um, and what would be my last one? Uh, oh, a, a, a very specific, a old style tin flour sifter. Not Ooh, the new ones. Okay, got it, all right. So we have a preference, we, we wanna go antique. Okay, we're gonna yeah. find out. Um, what about you, Kelly? Oh, Magreca, <laughs> that's, you know, top, all right. Um, and I will say, Yes, my air fryer, because, you know, uh, a mom has to make dinner and do conference calls at the same time. What do you want from us? Okay, and then um, I would have to say, um, let me see, uh, and this is going to be the New Yorican in me, okay, so y'all Caribbean and Puerto Rican folks, help me out. You know the thing where you, like, put the garlic in and you mash your garlic? Help me out. Pilon, thank you people. See, I like this audience participation. I'm just warming y'all up because this is a fireside chat, okay? But we in New York, we're gonna do it Brooklyn style. Yeah, I mean, hello. I mean, no no offense on the food processor, but when you need that certain flavor to come out in your beans, that's only, you know, the Pilon can give it to you. Okay, so um, those are my three. So, okay, so thank you all for bearing with us as we, as we get to the very important uh, topics, all right? First things first, okay. Um, so, you know, I just wanna thank you, uh, Dr. Perry, for, you know, putting uh, academic and statistics on top of many of our lived experience um, and translating what we have known to be our lived reality and the realities of our ancestors um, in such a poignant way because that paves the way for change, for transformational, <laughs> and standing up to the policymakers, right, that have all the power but supposed to be accountable to us, right? And so I think, you know, um, what you've painted for us is very clear, and I know I'm clear. Um, so let's get into that a little bit. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what are the concrete impacts and shifts that we've gained when we're centering racial equity and what's like left on the table um, when we don't? You know, I, I will say that I, I look at things um, over the, the last hundred years. Um, I don't just look at um, what happened this year or last year. Um, one thing that is true, we have fewer black people in poverty. That is true. However, um, we have not budged much on the home ownership rate. Um, we have many more people who qualify for homes, uh, but we're not budging on those issues. So, so what I find um, that there is an opportunity that 
particularly now because Freddie and Fannie, the GSEs, Freddie and Family, Fannie, started to incorporate rental payments into their underwriting practices. Why is that important? Because now you're going to see an expansion, you can see an expansion of these special purpose credit programs that will enable banks to let out mortgages without a down payment. Um, 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 who was it? One of the banks, I will, um, one of the banks um, issued a, uh, did a special program in five markets um, recently. Bank of, America. Bank of America, yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, um, it, is City a, a, a sponsor? That's why I didn't want to say it. <laughs> <laughs> You're so polite yeah, yeah. over here, but we in New York, we, you know what I'm saying, yeah, it's different America rules. Did. But, but, um, so we have that. So I always look on the bright side, and, and we also have many during the pandemic. One of the bright spots was that you started to see an uptick in black and brown millennials in home buying, largely because people were forced to save. But because student loans were frozen, it improved their, their um, um, debt income ratio and people bought in black and brown neighborhoods. And so for me, I think over the last um, few um, decades, we are seeing improvements, we are. Um, and in, in, in my work in particular, there was a re there's been a reckoning on the home valuation side. That is now leading, I mean, one, they released the data, uh, so, and we can identify who's the uh, uh, points of discrimination now. So, uh, but I do say this all the time. Any gain I made in terms of policy, Biden created an entire task force around my research. There's now all these um, federal and, and state and local uh, pieces of legislation around it. That would not have occurred if someone did not do the work 30 years ago. And the work that I'm doing today isn't really going to show up until 30 years later. So we don't, I mean, we're, and we should want to have this sense of urgency, but the reality is the work that you all are doing now oftentimes doesn't show up till later, but it will show up. We have to have faith that it will show up. Yeah, and I we're on the precipice of a lot of things. But that's because people are threatened by the changes that we're actually um, effectuating. So for me, I'm actually encouraged by the change. But yes, we have a lot more um, room to go. But we are making substantive changes in material um, um, asset building. Thank you for that long-term perspective um, and the hope that it's someone else. Um, we need that right now. Okay, so um, be honest with us. Give us the harsh truth. We could take it. We're New Yorkers. How are we doing? And you got to this just a little bit regionally, right? Um, how are we doing on addressing racial equity and community development? Uh, what do you think we're getting right? And what do you think we're lagging behind on? I, you know, th what's interesting is I think in terms of multiracial coalition. I know people may say, no, there's not there. There's not, we have problems here in New York. But you all are so far ahead in so many different ways than the rest of the, the country. Um, there are black, brown, Asian coalitions. Yes, there's fierce competition it, it, from, a, from a political perspective. But, you know, one, there is the embodiment of black and brown people. Right, you you have that, you you and a uh, black right, Asian, uh, Latinx. You have all this stuff going on, but you're really starting to see momentum. What is harsh here is one in terms of real estate. You know, you're talking about astronomical prices, where you're going to have to if you're going to see a significant shift in ownership in any kind of way, it's going to be. It's going to come from a different type of ownership. We're not. We're. 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 we're you're not going to see a changeover of property in the hands of people of color anytime soon. And so we're. We're going to have to really think about collective forms of ownership moving forward. And and. 
We need other forms of wealth building. That can come in the form of baby bonds. My colleague and friend Derek Hamilton talked about baby bonds. Um, we can imagine a time when there, there needs to be equity given to renters um, at some point. Because and, you know, we have a system in which the owner gets all the benefits. You know, and, and that just simply can't continue. Um, and so for me, I think the benefits here is people know how to organize. The, the hard thing is, man, it is New York City. And, you know, a price of a brownstone, I mean, it's off the charts now. So for me, it's, you have the people power um, and the organizing wherewithal, but it's a, it's a, I mean, it's a uphill climb. Yeah, I mean, I feel that. I am speaking from a renter's perspective, you know, with that goal. Um, and it's uh, love that you brought up collective ownership because there's a question in the audience. So I just want to say we got your questions. We're going to be bringing them into this interactive conversation a little later. Um, so thank you for submitting those. Um, so, but now I want to turn to you, Barika, right? Because you hold so much of this work right now um, with this uphill battle. It's like sometimes feel must feel like pushing a pebble up a mountain, um, but you do such a wonderful job of it. Um, where do you see um, us lagging behind here in New York? Oh, um, I mean, I, I, it's been interesting actually thinking about the Community Development Archive project and actually talking to some of these folks already. Um, I think even in the past two or three months of working on this, it started to make me shift a little bit of that because I, I don't think you can have that conversation of, what were we doing and where were we 40, 50 years ago without starting to do that bigger arc, right? I think a little bit we get like, what did we win last year? What did we win two years ago? And, and when you take a step back and we're like, what were we doing 50 years ago? It's, it's kind of hard not to acknowledge that we've had some big wins, right? So I think we're, right, we're, we're not at a place anymore where I have a map that tells me where I can and can't rent and where I can and can't buy a home. We're not at that anymore. And quite honestly, you know, team from Design for Democracy worked on this. That wasn't that long ago, right? Um, and yet at the same time, we are still a city where like almost all, I'm forgetting the numbers, I wonder if I can do these on the top of my head, but I think it's like most black purchases home purchases happen within 30 to 50 zip codes in a city that has about 250 zip codes, right? There's still an enormous amount of like funneling, concentration, lack of like where, we, where people can go, where they move, what their options are. And I think to your point of like New York City is expensive, I think one of the things that we, ANHD, our members, our movement are really starting to see and feel um, is that as the city gets more and more expensive and as it gets harder and harder to just survive here, it gets really hard to organize here. It gets really hard to do this work, right? Um, and we think about folks who are like, I was a community organizer and you know, I worked for city government or I was, right? Like the idea that that was a structure where you could own a home and be able to afford your groceries and right, and it, I think a lot of us right now are like, that would not work. That's not, that, like, that math is not going to math, right? Um, and so where, where we, like, what do we do if our price and our cost and the way living, just trying to, like, make it day to day in New York City is headed means that we're going to, like, push out and price out our movement. Um, and I think that that's a scary thing because people are doing who love this work, right? Um, met a bunch of folks around Black Lives Matter and Asian hate who had gotten into this new, right? Were activated very differently, but then really struggled with like, I can't make a career out of this, even though I'm really passionate about it. So I think this is something that we, we're, we're, we're struggling with and tangling with. We had to change some programs in the past year or so, just recognizing that it, that it has to look different now in order for people to sustain. 
Yeah, thank you. And thank you for the shout out to all of our grassroots community organizers, right? Um, coming from North Star Fund, that's near and dear to our heart, supporting that work. Um, so, Dr. Perry, we've made big inroads in doing the local analysis that is really uncovering the impacts of the status quo and longstanding and inequitable systems. Again, you like created like you brought this to life for us with a lot of your data analysis, and I loved how you placed it in your own personal story, because again, that's how most of us experience this issue. But how how do we then use this data, right, and this information to create policies that actually change the patterns on the ground and change the lived experiences for future generations? You know, I have the benefit of going from city to city and talking with uh, folks about this very issue. Um, one, when we created this report, I got calls from all over the country um, from homeowners who are, going, who are refinancing their home and saying, hey, I get, I'm getting lowballed. And because I work at a research organization, I, I'm not an advocate per se. I'm not an activist in, in the way that help this person directly, but what I, what I did do, every time I got a call, I forwarded those names to the New York Times, the Washington Post, the local newspapers. I also forwarded the names to the local fair housing groups. And um, while I, there's no way I can t take full credit for all that's happened around this one issue it's really because there was a coalition of people who used the data to their advantage. Data is really to be used as a convening, to convene people, and for you to figure out how to use it. I can provide suggestions, I can give you ammunition, but I say this all the time, that you have the solution, right? You, you may need the right stars to align. You may need the empirical evidence. We're not short on solutions. We're short on organizing. The, we have got to organize, organize, organize. I mean, it, I mean and so for me, I, I can present these data every day uh, I don't necessarily have to write another report. I, I mean, I'm going to write every every day. But, I, but what I've learned from this is all I needed to do was give people the spark, the energy, the information, and they run with it. There, there are ordinances all across this country now created because of one report. And... Um, so I can't take credit. That was because people already knew what to do. So I think, yes, um, what I need to do is um, continue to accept these kind of invitations to say, hey, there are, there are solutions. There's people out there who are like, you know what? This is how I'm going to use the data. So it's there for, for, for people to use. I love that. Um, and speaking of what you're seeing across the country, right? Because there is some amazing work that's happening. You know, when I think about ordinances, I'm like, oh, the folks in Detroit, they're doing it with the community benefits agreement, you know? Lots of stuff um, happening. So what other policies and innovations um, are you seeing, you know, popping up in other places that we should be thinking about here in New York City? You know, I, I think um, in Chicago, there, um, I mentioned in the presentation about equity scoring, and technically we use this, to, I mean, this phrase, um, that, I guess that's jargon too, equity scoring, but uh, racial equity um, impact assessments. And in general, w um, what they're, we're doing is we're trying to examine the, the just distribution of goods. Now, um, low-income tax credits, and as, as most of you know, um, in exchange for equity, you get these tax benefits, um, um, 
and hopefully that equity can be used to help build um, um, property that can benefit people. But we also know that these low income tax credits given to the wrong developers in the, in the wrong plans can make matters worse. And so what Chicago did, you had um, um, grassroots organizers, civic groups, um, city government, as well as developers, um, um, develop a plan to, um, to run these tax credits um, through a racial equity impact assessment. And so that they distribute these um, LIHTC, uh, uh, um, um, these low income tax credits to projects in a way that won't exacerbate the problems that we see. And so I, I do think that there's some of that going on in the city. Um, the city um, committed to these racial equity um, um, plans er, er, early on. Um, now we have to push them. You know that they're they're there. You know you have a you know you, they're there in writing, right? And so we got to make it happen like they're doing in Chicago. And that same sort of thinking is going on across the country. Um, my colleagues uh, uh, Zav Briggs, uh, Javier Briggs, and Rick McGahey wrote a report on these racial. Um, equity impact assessments. You, if you Google that, um, you'll f um, you'll find that, and there's several different types. But I think those are the kinds of things that New York City can um, employ in order for us to see the kind of racial equity um, in in a, in and around this housing issue. And one more thing, I have to say that where I also just need to see a lot more organizing in is around on the labor front. Because nothing will be affordable, ever, if people don't have wages to make it affordable. We, we talk about supply and demand all the time, but we don't talk about paying people, right? And so like at the end of the day, if people don't have the income, nothing will ever be affordable. So we also need to work around those, um, those goals as well. Yes, and thank you for highlighting that. And again, a shout out to you all the folks have been organizing around, you know, wages, living wages for, you know, all of our folks. Um, New York has been leading on that. Let's hope we can keep that going, sliding that in there. Um, so Barika, this next question is for you. Um, we talked about some of the potentials and thank you for reminding us about the long view and for those geeky planning students out there, the long dure, right? We, that's how we're trained to think about things 50 years, 100 years. Um, but what are the obstacles, right, and the challenges that keep New York City from being able to take up and adopt these type of national best practices that we are just hearing from Dr. Perry? Yeah, I mean, when you were saying that, I was like, ooh, wouldn't that be nice? Um, uh, and it, it's, it's, you know, I, it's a hard, I, I don't know what other people would say. It's, it feels like a weird tension in New York City. Um, because to your point, we are doing a lot on this, especially compared to a lot of other places. Um, and I think we all, um, and I will say me building on people who came before me, have gotten so much smarter and so much more sophisticated with this. Right? Like, what we're talking about in terms of data analysis and equity analysis and assessments, right? We, we learned lessons in things like the Fourth Avenue rezoning and then said, okay, we're ready, right? We're ready for when this next time comes. We saw what this did to this community and neighborhood. And not only are we going to have the numbers um, or the city does, isn't set up, uh, up to give us the numbers, so we're going to first demand the data so that we can then show you the numbers, um, but then we are going to collaborate in a way where it's not that neighborhood fighting for itself because we know what happens there impacts, what happens in Cypress Hills is gonna happen, is gonna impact the South Bronx, it's gonna impact Kingsbridge, it's gonna impact East Harlem, right? And so we got really smart about how we're doing this. I think the, we have two hurdles, one is that our 
Systemic inequalities and the power behind them is deeply entrenched here. Deeply, deeply entrenched. And they will fight, the they, whatever that entity, beast, mon monster is, will fight uh, like the Dickens against even things that kind of everybody's like, what are, why, why are we arguing over that? Like, I just, I feel like we all have things where we're like, this, we're having this fight right now? We're going to say, I mean, I get it. We can argue about like the little mechanics, but we're actually going to argue if this is like a good or a bad thing. And we do. We spend a year, two years, three years fighting over if this should even happen when it's like, that's not really the question. Um, and then the other piece I think here is like we, the, the amount of work that it takes to like, to maneuver something through our political systems. To go from the like smart idea that let's say finally everybody is on board with to actually having it have that impact. Like, I, I wish that we could go from the report to now people being like, and we're changing our ordinances. But somehow we tend to like, that just tends to take this like really long time here, it feels like. Um, and so I, I think, a, it's a good reminder that it, it's a, we're still, we're now, just now, enjoying the successes of fights that people had 30 years ago. I feel like that, for me, is like a very good grounding reminder um, because we forget that the fight that we're having right now isn't necessarily for us for tomorrow. And then can I just add that you're seeing all across the country, and it, it will hit hard in New York City soon, around land use issues, or particularly around zoning ordinances. So all across the country, those rules and laws are changing. And so we're, in our efforts to increase density, um, you're starting to see cities bend around many of the many um, single family zoning ordinances but also changes in the way school districts are drawn, um, around planning for commercial corridors. Yeah, it's, it's slow. And you can only point to a few places that are really doing it right now. Oh, but it's coming. It is, it is absolutely coming. And it's going to hit New York City. Um, and so, um, yeah, you, you know, you have New York City and L.A. that are fully entrenched in their system. And, you know, what's interesting, you, you, you're, they're blue states, blue, uh, you have blue cities, and they're some of the worst in terms of making substantive change. But if you're going to be sustainable in the near future, you're going to have to do something about around housing. You're going to have to do something around energy. You're going to have to do something about paying people not just a living wage, but giving people pay where they can actually develop wealth. So for me, it's, you know, I, I, I think we're on that precipice, and you're seeing it because you're also seeing a resistance to change that is, that is going back 30 years, that... There were, I mean, the person who, um, one of the, the, the folks who re reared me told me, they, she told me all the time, hey, this is like it was um, right before you were born. And that there was, there was going to be a lot of bloodshed, there's going to be a lot of fighting, there's going to be a lot of, of chaos, and then there's going to be a dawn. And so, I, you know... I just think we're going to be ready because we're experiencing a lot right now. And that's why I try to end with that we got to work together because there's people struggling with global conflict, local conflict, all these different things. But um, and unfortunately, and this is what saddens me, but um, I want to hear more voices that, that, that light, that, um, that moral clarity during these times, that one of the, the, the fact, what white supremacy does a lot is to rob us of that hope, to make us think there's, there's nothing better. Yeah. 
And, you know, I just don't believe in that. You know, I, I say, hey, we need some clarity around this. We can see change. Yes. And uh, oh, we have one more question. Oh, one more minute. Okay. So uh, I do want to get to the audience's questions um, over here. Uh, but I do want you, Barika, to have a chance. Oh, okay. Got it. Um, so, I know you told me how to work this nifty, um, wait, wait, can I unlock it? You have to sign in. No? Okay. Oh, here we go. Okay, y'all. Did I just date myself just a little bit? Okay. Um, all right. All right. So, um, we have a couple of questions here. Um, I'm going to go with some that have, like, yes, please ask this, like a plus one. So how do you remove perception uh, from white investment dollars flow? And would AI help with this issue? Oh, wow. Well, what's interesting is the only way... I picked an easy one um, to start, as you can see. I softballed this. You know, one of the reasons why I do talk about, I do make an economic case is that although we need to also make a moral case, you know, uh, um, but I do make an economic case because even in that hearing in which I was in, which was at that time, that was a Trump, um, uh, there was a, a, a Republican House, I was the minority uh, voice on that at, at that table. But even the Republicans were asking, how much money are we losing? That oftentimes, I, I, while I don't point to disparities a lot, I'm always looking at the assets in communities. Because I do believe that when people really start to see, one, the value they're losing, but also I do think it's just hard on people to continuously cut their nose to spite their face. And that's what you're seeing all the time. People are just looking foolish now. You know, looking this straight up foolish. And that wears on people. So for me, you get out of it by always have showing the assets, the strength. No one invests in problems. And yet, in, as a researcher, I belong to a class of people that were constantly showing their problems. We're also, we're con I'm I was trained to do regression by putting white men in the referent group. And to show how we uh, regression you know, analysis. Right, okay, right, you're right. giving me flashbacks over here. Like I get. Don't be afraid of statistics. It's a good thing. But but the point is that we never show the pot the the a, a different way. So we do that, and also we, there's only one way to to increase um, uh, a positive perception, and that's through investing. So when we um, when we trust that that these homes, businesses, are simply underappreciated assets, meaning if you just add water, they will grow. If, when people add water, they will grow. And then you start to change the environment. Um, and so for me, it starts with investment. Wonderful, and do we have time for one more, or are we, um, no, we our timekeepers? Get, no, we, we okay, we do not. So that just means reception time. All right, uh, that <laughs> is not you know hard <laughs> to interpret. Okay, so stay around. You guys stay. Just one sec. You will, we'll stay here for a sec. Oh, we're gonna stay. Yeah, we're gonna stay I knew for this. a second. I knew this. Um, and then behind us, right? Coming up. Okay. Yes. Um. Um. So, uh, Barlow. Um. Senior Vice President for Community Relations, Northeast Leader for City, um, who is our Movement Leader Sponsor, is going to come and share a few remarks at the podium. We can just stay here for a moment. Yes, and thank you for this chat. This was amazing. Uh, should adjust the mic. Barika was here before, probably. <laughs> <laughs> evening, everyone. Uh, oh, evening. Can you all hear me now? Thanks, Barika, for the warm introduction. I don't want to be the person to keep you all from refreshments and conversation, so I'll 
try to get through this as quickly as possible. But um, it's really a pleasure to be here, um, to be a supporter and an ally and a partner with ANHD. Um, what a wonderful conference series that ANHD has put on once again. So a round of applause for Barika and team. And like I mentioned, we've, we've been a longtime partner and supporter of ANHD and many of the member organizations um, that are present here from the community development sector. Um, I'm sure Barika mentioned earlier, um, before I arrived, as I was lagging behind on the train, uh, that we've been on quite this journey across New York City neighborhoods through the conference series. From the opening session um, that brought experts from the community development sector and setting the stage for all the advancements that have taken place over the past 49 to 50 years of community development. Our journey has taken us to the Lower East Side, to a walking tour in the Bronx, then next to Harlem, then to Flatbush in Brooklyn where I personally attended um, to hear about the great work that is being done with small businesses, but also the complex history that is present in New York City and how we reconcile with that history. Then we went to tour industrial zones in Brooklyn and Queens where I gained greater perspective on the history and the valuable role that IBZs play in sustaining New York City from a workforce development perspective. And now we're here uh, to have our final conversation and celebrations on advancing racial equity in community development. So for City, um, we've been advancing, it, we've been invested in advancing community development for quite some time. Our community relations team um, is embedded in our broader function of city community investing and development, which at its core is working across all of city's functions and businesses to catalyze societal impact, social impact in community. Our team brings together a community investing toolkit from city foundation philanthropy and equity investing to volunteerism, community engagement to technical assistance and social finance under a shared goal to serve as a trusted problem solver to community. And our work centers around making sure that there are more on-ramps to economic opportunity than off-ramps. Our ultimate goal is to level the playing field for communities and households that have not had the same access to financial and social capital. So the range of our toolkit reflects that it's not about philanthropy versus market-based solutions because the truth is we need both. And we're constantly thinking about ways and how we can catalyze that social impact across our businesses and functions. Many of you are aware that a couple years ago, Cities launched its Action for Racial Equity that was made in 2020, from which City and the City Foundation committed to more than a billion dollars to help close the racial wealth gap in the US. Our approach has been multifaceted. One, providing greater access to banking and credit in communities of color. Um, increasing investments in black owned businesses, as Dr. Perry eloquently outlined in his um, analysis and report. Expanding home ownership among black Americans, and last but not least, advancing anti-racist practices in the financial services industry. Some recent examples of our continued support of advancing equity um, is just last year in 2022, the City Foundation announced a $50 million community finance innovation fund designed to support the next level of growth for CDFIs and MDIs across the US. Some local organizations that are based here in New York that were recipients of that fund were LISC and Inclusive. And since 2020, City has provided over 1.32 billion in capital and the foundation is committed to over 115 million in grants for CDFIs and community organizations. We also understand that we have to continue to evolve and change our business practices. And that's why City created the first of its kind diverse financial institutions group which leads the bank's engagement with MDIs and helps them to scale and expand into new markets. The approach for this group um, has been powerful. Uh, $44 million in equity investments in 11 MDIs, strengthening the MDIs balance sheets through equity investments, enhancing their ability to s serve racially diverse households and entrepreneurs in the communities that they serve. Additionally, City has employed strategic philanthropy as the City Foundation created the Community Progress Makers Initiative in 2015 that is designed to power the work of leading local nonprofit organizations connecting low to moderate income household communities 
to greater social and economic opportunity by providing them with unrestricted capacity building funding, which ANHD and many of the member organizations have been recipients of CPM, Community Progress Makers. And just recently, we announced um, the RFP for cohort number four, which commits, commits $50 million to the CPM initiative that represents a sustained belief in the power of catalytic trust-based philanthropy to accelerate the pace of progress. Through this open RFP process, 50 organizations will be selected to each receive $1 million in unrestricted funding over the next three years. The funding will be paired with a learning community where they can collaborate and share best practices, as well as take advantage of technical assistance delivered by national experts and leading researchers. So now, you know, I can go on about many other examples of how cities invest in community, but I promised Barika I'd be brief, <laughs> and I don't want to stand in the way of everyone enjoying the rest of the night. So I'll close by saying this. City continues to deliver on our commitment to helping create a more diverse and equitable financial services system. We're proud of our efforts to date, but know that there's a lot more work to be done to have sustained impact in communities. We have a strong interest in continuing to engage with all of you in the room and more, and we're happy and eager to listen on ways that we can explore collaboration. And our collaboration with ANHD, I think it's proof that we're indeed here and we're committed uh, and we know we'll go far together in partnership. So thank you again, and enjoy the rest of the evening. Um, thank you to Barlow, and I do want to say a shout out and thank you to the whole city team. Um, they are, somebody from city was with us on every single one of these trips and sites. Um, and we've had these awesome conversations and connections so just really appreciate um, them actually being like, not just we're here and we're gonna partner, but like we're actually gonna partner and we're gonna see what this looks like and we're gonna talk to these businesses. So thanks to the city team that I know is right there. Um, all right, so, uh, for a sec, Barlow. Um, so we're gonna break and head out for the reception. I just wanna, first of all, thanks to City Tech for having us here. For those who don't know, one thing that we did have do differently last year and this year is that we put almost all of our um, dollars for putting those these events on into community spaces and small businesses. Uh, so that's who is hosting our our venues. Uh, yes, right. Um, so we're trying to put our lo our dollars to work. Um, and so when you go out, you will also um, we'll have food and drinks from Collective Fair, um, who's catering our reception. Um, Co-founder Latoya Medgers uh, is with us today. Uh, Collective Fair's mission is to create collaborative and collaborative collaborate and sustain equitable initiatives surrounding food systems, food security, workforce development, and the necessary changes we need to make to, towards food sovereignty. So they host educational and training programs. They sort of do culinary education. So they do this, but they're also training people to be able to do this. They switched their model in the middle of COVID to be serving the neighborhood of Brownsville. And LaToya was a part of the Inclusive Growth Initiative to really think about how we're like growing New York City in the moment of COVID inclusively as opposed to leaving people behind. So we love that we're able to bring them to all of you all. And for anybody who's got a thing coming up where you're like, who am I gonna? That's why we want folks here um, so that you can start to resource them as well. Uh, DJ Pusha will be out there with us for some music so we can enjoy. Um, uh, I want to thank the staff team again for all of the work to put this on. Lucy um, Leiden and Loose Productions in the back. Um, and then last but not least of the two, Kelly Terry for moderating. Let's give her an awesome round of applause. Uh, and a huge thank you to Dr. Andre Perry. Um, it's so amazing and exceptional uh, to be here with him. And thanks, Barika, for all <laughs> yes, of your hard work. Yes, um, So we will see everybody outside. We'll be there to talk and chat. Some people I know have to head out. We know it's a busy time, so we know some people may be headed to other events or things and activities in the street. Keep yourself safe um, and enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you.